good morning, everybody. Good morning. Welcome to what has turned into an ice skating rink uh, across Sydney, Bainbridge, Unadilla, and many other places. Uh, we are uh, live streaming. We did have a couple people uh, brave the elements this morning. I don't know if they got here with sled dogs or, or what, but they got here. So we are going to have our 1015 service. We're not going to have music today. Uh, Miss Sarah, Sarah Pressler, uh, couldn't make it here because of the ice. Uh, what I would say is if you look uh, online, there's a couple of people we have here, uh, you should notice that uh, the hymns are, are listed, the hymns are online, so if you want to sing them uh, out loud, uh, you can find accompaniments online, or as a little kid said once, you can sing them acapulco, which I think he meant to say acapella. So, uh, but I did just want to offer worship, even though the weather is bad, I, I think we're kind of fortunate because we haven't had a major snowstorm yet. I remember last year, a week before Christmas, we had, what, like three feet, Melissa? So we got some ice. It's not good, but, you know, it, it could be a lot worse, and, and God is good. So welcome on our Baptism of the Lord Sunday. This is the Sunday in the church calendar where we celebrate the baptism of Jesus. Kind of crazy, because two weeks ago he was a baby, he was born, and then he was 12 in the temple, and now he's 30. So the, these kids, they grow up so quick, right? You turn around, boom, they're adults, right? So uh, we do have our, our greeting uh, that we have printed in our bulletin. I know we have the PowerPoint out. I don't know if Melissa's going to be advancing the slides just because there's not uh, too many here. But uh, what I would say is for those watching online, and this will be sent out on YouTube, feel free uh, just looking at our resources, whether they're online or you printed them. Just follow along as if you're sitting here, hopefully under a warm blanket at home, maybe have some hot cocoa or something. So let's enter into worship. Our greeting this morning is from the Gospel of Luke chapter 3. I'm going to read and you are welcome to respond. The Holy Spirit dances in the water, waiting in baptism to join us in the fire of God's love and new life in Christ. Come to the water. Come to the Holy Spirit. Come to the journey of a lifetime. A journey through death to life everlasting. Our unison gathering prayer this morning is from Psalm 8 and the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 25. And as I always say, the family that prays together stays together. This is a prayer designed for us to pray together. If you're watching online, if you're watching for the first time, even though we are not all physically gathered, we are together as the body of Christ. We are here uh, many of us being baptized Christians, which is what I'll be talking about this morning. So won't you say this prayer with me as you're able? God of love and mercy, as we enter a new year in the life of this church, may our love for you be made known and our love for one another. Help us leave old grievances and former arguments behind as we open our hearts to the possibilities that lie before us. Guide our footsteps into the glory of your ways, that we may live as you created us to be. Beloved children, crowned with glory and honor, may our worship reflect the greatness of our calling and the honor of our heritage. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, I've never quite figured out how to virtually greet each other online, um, but for the couple of folks that are here this morning, peace of Christ. Uh, we were going <laughs> to undecorate after the service today, so I guess we're going to do that during the week, but we still do have our beautiful Christmas tree. So all of you watching, friends, peace of Christ be with you, and my, my fervent prayer for all of you this morning is that you stay safe and that you, uh, you don't go out without you know boots or ice skates on until all of this is melted. So we are planning on gathering again next Sunday. Our call to worship for this morning. Sorry, Terry DeRoche, I'm stealing your thunder uh, because I'm doing the call to worship. But this is Psalm 29, Isaiah 43. I won't ask the couple people we have to stand, but normally we would. So uh, let's do our call to worship. I'll read it and you can respond. Sing praises to the Lord. Sing of God's glory and strength. God calls us over the waters and strengthens us for the journey. Sing praises to Christ. Sing of Christ's healing and love. The waters of our baptism cleanse us, renewing our spirits and nursing our wounds. Sing praises to the Holy Spirit. Sing of the Holy Spirit's comfort and hope. The flames of the Holy Spirit are like a refiner's fire, 
purifying the soul to the glory of God through Jesus Christ. Now, if we had a choir this morning, and if Jack Doyle and anybody else from the choir is watching, we are very uh, not spoiled today because we don't have all of your, your gifts and graces here with us. But we were going to sing uh, an a anthem called, Oh, the Lord Came Down to the River, because again, this is Baptism of the Lord Sunday. So we are not blessed with that this morning, but we can just imagine uh, what that would be like. Well, let's also move our, our flowers, our altar flowers down here. So that folks could see them. I know a lot of times after service, people will take them with them and give them to a shut-in or, or somebody who's ill. So she wanted you to all see those this morning. And for the children's ministry that I have today, we, we don't have any children. We don't really have much of anybody here today. But today I'm talking about baptism. And I wanted to ask the kids what it is. And generally, when I ask most kids what baptism is, they go, that thing where you put the water on you. Or that thing where I go under the water and come back up. So baptism is what I'll be talking about today. And baptism is our way of showing Jesus that we are now one of his followers officially. But historically, it also means we're part of the church. So you can repent of your sins. You can come to Jesus Christ. But still never become a member of the church. Somebody who's dying can accept Jesus, receive salvation. But yet... Never become part of the church. So baptism is very, very significant. And for those who are watching kids and otherwise, if you've never been baptized, this is what makes the official stamp on it. You already have repented, you've already come to Christ, but how do you officially become part of the 2000 year church? It's through baptism, through the waters, through the cleansing, through the power of the Holy Spirit. So. Uh, kids, I, I hope you're behaving this morning. Hopefully, as Bob and Dad are watching this, you're not running around throwing things. Hopefully not. Um, know that we miss you. Um, know that we love you. And um, just hope and pray that everything will be cleared up. Because we don't want to snow day tomorrow, right, kids? They would be very upset about that. So uh, let, let's pray for our kids. Lord God, we thank you for our children. We thank you for their laughter and their joy. We thank you for the waters of baptism. And we thank you that these waters of baptism are open for us all so that we can become one of your followers, part of your church. And if we're young, one day come to Christ through our repentance. Or if we're older, repent of our sins and be baptized. What a gift it is as your son Jesus was baptized this day. In your name we pray. Amen. So it is, it is kind of weird to be honest talking to you in a church that's mostly empty. But what got me prepared for this was COVID last year, because we were shut down and there was no one here. And I joked that I felt like the dictator of North Korea making videos in the bunker. You know, all I needed was that green screen behind me where I could make it look like anything. There's like really nobody here, but like I'm pretending. So that's always been kind of creepy and weird for me. Um, some announcements we have this morning. We're continuing to do our 365 day Bible study. The diplomas, if you will, the graduation, are these uh, Holy Bible ornaments. Uh, so if you've participated in that in any way, you can grab one. Or I guess in this case, if you just, just want one, because we have some extras. But this Tuesday at 4.30 on, on Zoom online, you can call in, you can click in. We're going to continue our 365-day Bible study, and we're on week 49. So we do have uh, uh, three, four more weeks to go. So I guess uh, Deb Ramada gave us our... Our diploma's a little early. So if you want to join us Tuesday at 4.30, um, I will send uh, an email up. I also have one here that we're undecorated after church. Well, that's not going to happen today. So, so I know that a couple people are coming down tomorrow to help with that. Um, and, and we really do appreciate that because we weren't expecting, you know, the whole area to turn into an ice skating rink all of a sudden. Uh, but such is winter, right? We will have choir practice this Wednesday. We will rehearse uh, Sunday at 945. We would have done that today again, but such is the weather. Uh, this Tuesday, we have a trustees meeting at 630 um, on a phone conference. Uh, and then the following Tuesday, we're going to have church finance and church council the 18th at 6 and 7 p.m. And that will be on the Zoom program. Next Sunday, we have a, one of our special giving Sundays. There's six in the United Methodist Church. It's called Human Relations Day. We'll have envelopes in the bulletin. And uh, this money goes to help uh, community programs, at-risk teens, things of that nature. The United Methodist Church has these special giving Sundays. 
you're, you're welcome to give to that. Don't feel pressured to do so, but this is another way that we raise funds for all these different things. Uh, one other thing, this came through uh, community Catholic Charities. On Wednesday, January 26th at 11 a.m. at the Fire Department here in Sydney, there's going to be a community partnership uh, mass food distribution. So you can go in and you can um, get food. It says, please don't arrive before 11, is what it says here. And they're going to have food, fresh food, vegetables, and other items. So if, if you need food, or if you know somebody that needs food, they are going to do that. Uh, my guess is this is continuing to happen because of this uh, pandemic. And unfortunately, uh, we continue to have more and more people have, have cases, which is just awful. I was kind of hoping and, and praying that uh, at this point we would be through this, but uh, alas, we are not. So those are the announcements I have. The three people we have today, you guys have <laughs> announcements. So I can't believe Ruby and Kingsley made it. I don't know how you made it. Did, did you change and, and like studs have to get down? Well, we split with that one. I mean, my goodness. I don't know. Like, you, 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 it's like a nuclear bomb goes off and Kingsley and Ruby walk and go, did something happen? So it's just uh, amazing that you guys made it. So we would normally do our opening hymn. And Melissa and I toyed this morning with the idea of, oh, we want to, you know, like play the music in the background. And I try to sing, and hopefully the same last one goes, don't crack from my voice. Uh, but what we decided was, you know, it's really not worth singing if we don't have uh, a good amount of people here. But, you know, the words of the hymns we have this morning, uh, the first one, opening hymn is 73, O Worship the King. If, if you read through it, it's just powerful stuff. The first verse says, O worship the King, all glorious above. O gratefully sing God's power and God's love. Our shield and defender, the ancient of days, pavilioned in splendor and girded with praise. Just beautiful words. Some of these old hymns that people don't like to sing anymore, um, I just love them because they're just so rich and they're so full of um, so many things. So if you want to look through that, uh, it, it should be, again, online and I just emailed it out. Um, and again, I'm not going to sing it because I don't want to have to make you go to the ear doctor as a result of that. So joys and concerns this morning. Uh, we're continuing to pray for uh, Jack Doyle and Deb Vermont. Our, our great music director, our great our children's ministry director, who are both going through cancer treatments and getting chemotherapy, but yet continuing to serve, continuing to do so much. So grateful for them. As we don't have in person church this morning because of some ice, we're really blessed, though, aren't we? I mean, other than that, we couldn't go to church today. But you know who's really struggling? People in Kentucky that, that got hit with those tornadoes. In Colorado, I think over 8,000 people have lost their homes. So, woohoo, we have a little bit of ice, we don't have a person church today. But none of us are hurt, none of us are sick, there, there's really no problems, and this too shall pass, right? Continuing to pray for uh, Tammy Hood, as she, she, he's had sur- she's had surgery. Uh, our own Mary Braun, if you're watching, hello, good morning, Mary and Fred. Uh, Mary will be getting a, 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 like a lighter surgery tomorrow, so prayers for that. A uh, good friend of mine, brother in Christ, Will Spahos, who's the, uh, I guess he, he is kind of a late preacher of sorts over at North Athens. He preaches there a few Sundays a month. He's going to be getting a knee replacement, I think, this Wednesday. So uh, prayers for him. The other uh, joy, I guess, I, as I wanted to say, is we got a massive donation. Actually, thanks, thanks to the King Kingsley's in part. Uh, disposable masks, uh, san- sanitizing wipes. Rubber gloves, but I feel like we have like a storehouse now for for cleaning. But if anybody needs masks or uh, sanitizing wipes or rubber gloves, I mean, I feel like we have a department store here. So um, I know some other pastors have come by, some other church members, and they've gotten some for their churches. So we have a ton of them. Um, if, if you're watching this and that's something you want, um, just let us know and you can come down. Um, I'll be around obviously all day today. I, I don't know if I'd recommend coming today unless you have, you know, ice skates or studs on your shoes, but certainly tomorrow. Uh, so those are the joys and concerns I have out of the couple people we have here. Do we have any joys or concerns? Okay. So I guess what I'll do is, with all of the people that are here, uh, I, <laughs> I will offer um, a, a, a prayer for us. My, my joke with Melissa until the Kingsley's came is, I was going to say, everybody today is going to think this sermon is great that was here. And Melissa probably would, what? Oh, the, the rocks. I'm sorry. Yeah, I, 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 I had so many churches I think she's talking 
For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I give Egypt as your ransom, Ethiopia and Seba in exchange for you, because you are precious in my sight, and honored, and I love you. I give people in return for you, nations in exchange for your life. Do not fear, for I am with you. I will bring you offspring from the east and from the west. I will gather you. I will say to the north, give them up, and to the south, do not withhold. Bring my sons from far away, and my daughters from the end of the earth. Everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. And our second reading this morning is from the book of the Acts of the Apostles, which is the book about the early church after Jesus ascends, or right when he ascends into heaven, and what those first apostles or disciples do with the gospel. And this is what it says this morning, uh, Acts chapter 8, verses 14 to 17. And in our Red Pew Bible, 118 in the New Testament, um, I did not include the scripture readings with our resources, but feel free to open a Bible you have, or a Bible app, if you have that on a smart device. Um, and this is what Acts 8, 14 to 17 says this morning. Now, when the apostles at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them. The two went down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. As for yet, the Spirit had not come upon any of them. They had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then Peter and John laid their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. Once again, the word of God through the people of God. Thanks be to God. Now, our, our hymn of preparation, which again I won't sing, because I don't want to do any bodily harm to anybody, is when Jesus came down to the Jordan. It's a really short one, three verses, uh, 252, I'll read the first verse to you. When Jesus came to Jordan to be baptized by John, he did not come for pardon, but as the sinless one. He didn't come repentant, because he was God, God doesn't need to repent. He came to share repentance with all who mourn their sins, to speak the vital sentence which the good news begins. So it's this great hymn we have on the baptism of Jesus Christ, which is exactly what I will be talking about this morning. So anybody that is here, which only a few of us, if, if you'd like to uh, stand as I read uh, the Word of God this morning, the Gospel of Luke, that would be great. Now that I incorrectly said your last name once, sorry. <laughs> so... I guess I'm human too, right? So our, our reading this morning um, uh, is, is one of the narratives about the baptism of Jesus. It's a really special moment. Jesus is put in the river by his cousin John the Baptist. Um, and every time I baptize, I have a little bottle of water from the Jordan River. And I always put a little bit of that in because that's the water source that Jesus our Lord was baptized in. So the Gospel of St. Luke is our reading this morning. Chapter 3, verses 15 to 17, and 21 and 22. In our Red Bible, it's page 56 in the New Testament. Let's hear what God's Word has to say this morning about the baptism of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is what it says. As the people were filled with expectation, and all were questioning in their hearts concerning John, whether he might be the Messiah, John answered all of them by saying, I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than I is coming, and I am not worthy to untie the thong with his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his granary. But the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. Now, when all the people were baptized, and when Jesus had also been baptized and was praying, um, the heaven was open, and the Holy Spirit descended upon him in bodily form, like a dove. And a voice came down from heaven, saying, You are my Son, the Beloved, with whom I am well pleased. And once again, this is the Word of God through the people of God. Thanks be to God, you may be seated. Well, again, when, when you write a sermon, and you expect a, a whole bunch of people to be here, and it's not the case, um, I guess it's a little different. I remember Melissa and I met up at Potsdam College, and I remember I was in a, a public speaking class. Um, of the couple people here, anybody ever have to give a speech in front of class? 
like when you were in high school. And I used to hate that. I, my hands would get cold. I would get nervous. And now after years of this, they're going, is this kid going to shut up? i got to go home for lunch. So, but I remember I was in one of these classes, and one of the, one of the four young women, she would go in the night before to an empty room, that's pretty much what we have, and she would put tape on the floor where she had to stand. And I think one day this poor girl nearly fainted in this class because she had to give a few speeches. I don't know what it was. They wanted her to talk for five minutes on frogs or something. I guess it really doesn't matter, but she was just so, so nervous. But I actually like to talk to people and, and not have them confused. So with that said, have you ever heard expressions in your life such as time just flies by, or you blink and you miss it, or where did the years go? I really like the one that my, my grandma uh, E says, or she used to say, she would say, life is like a roll of toilet paper. It gets smaller and goes quicker. That's what she used to say. And I've also been told, some people have told me, particularly now that I'm 40, Paul, you've got to remember to take some time off. you got to remember to enjoy yourself. And you have to remember and stop and smell the roses along the way. Anybody ever heard that before? Stop and smell the roses? But we have the general idea that life flies by. And I've talked to some people twice my age, and they've said things like, you know, Pastor Paul, I just turned around one day and I was 80. It just was amazing how quick it went, you know? I, uh, there's, there's a really good country song I've heard. I don't know the title of it, but the, the kind of the theme behind it is by dirt. And, and what the guy's telling his son is, you know, buy some land, propose to the person you love, Go to church, put a couple of dollars in, and enjoy life because it just goes by real, real quick. And it, it's weird to me because it seems like a couple of days ago I was in high school, and now I'm 40. I'm not a kid anymore because Spence Ridley told me I'm not a kid now I'm a young man, so I've been elevated up a little bit. But the reason I say all of this about life going by quick is like two weeks ago on Christmas, we had baby Jesus. Now he's 30 and he's getting baptized, right? I mean, you thought your kids grew up quick. This is a bit extreme. Imagine if you had a kid and two weeks later they were 30. That would be kind of nuts, but that's what we have in the church calendar. Well, why is that? Well, Jesus is born, and then outside of those birth narratives of Luke and Matthew, which I talked about the differences and how we can reconcile them, the only other information we have on Jesus' childhood is when he's 12 in the temple, they're down there for the Passover, and Mary and Joseph and all the other people head back to Nazareth, and they realize that Jesus isn't with them. They come back, and they finally find him after five days. And after that, when they go back to Nazareth, we hear nothing about Jesus until he's there. So one of, one of my colleagues last night, we were talking on Facebook, he said, what else do you think happened in Jesus' childhood? Because we don't really have any information on that whatsoever. And I said, well... His dad was a carpenter. He probably worked hard. He probably went to the synagogue, which is like the Jewish church. He learned the scriptures. He was part of the community. I'm sure everybody knew he was special from day one, but he grew up. He worked hard. We have every reason to think that if you wanted a good piece of furniture or something done, Jesus was a blue-collar worker and he could get it done. He probably could build a church like this, if I had to guess. He learned how to work. He learned how to live like the rest of us. Now, the 12 days of Christmas, because I had been talking about that, ended this past Wednesday. And a few days ago, on Thursday, we officially had the day of Epiphany, which is the day we celebrate the wise men coming. But church, Christmas is now over. Now, I don't know about you, but when we talk about life going by quick, or the years going by quick, doesn't it seem like yesterday we had Christmas? All of this fanfare and all of this hoopla and boom, Christmas is over, and everything right now looks like an ice cream. Go figure, right? And the crazy thing to me is there's only 12 days of Christmas. Advent's like the whole month, uh, but Christmas is 12 days. So sometimes we stretch it out a little bit just to try to get a little bit more of Christmas. Now, what I want to talk about with all that said is baptism this morning. Baptism is significant. I was baptized 40 years ago as a baby at St. Patrick's Roman Catholic Church in Woodstock, Illinois. I don't remember it because I was, I think, a couple of months old. But as Christians, for 2,000 years, we get baptized. For the few people that are here today by a show of hands, how many of you have been baptized? 
I have never heard of a Christian church before that does not believe in some kind of baptism. And even though two weeks ago Jesus was a baby and now he's 30, and there, there's another phrase we've heard, kids, they grow up, grow up so quickly, right? So two weeks later, Jesus is full grown. He gets baptized in the Jordan River, and he does so by immersion. And we have different Christian churches out there, and in, in centuries past, they would kill each other over what they thought was the right way to baptize. We have to immerse the person. No, no, we're not going to do it that way. And it would get really heated and really hostile. And then we have, we have some Christian denominations that don't use water for baptism at all. Well, why is that? In our scripture this morning, John the Baptist said, I baptize you with water, but the one who is coming after me is going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. So because of verses like that, denominations like the Salvation Army or the Quakers, also known as the Society of Friends, they don't use water for baptism because they believe that a, a holy fire, a Holy Spirit baptism is what baptism is. That being said, though, the vast majority of, of Christian churches, all through the ages, all over the world, they baptize in some way, shape, or form using water. Hopefully clean water. That's what we do here. And so, some, some people sprinkle, some people immerse. I know some of our Eastern Orthodox brothers and sisters, they not only immerse babies, but they triple immerse them. They put them under in the name of the Father, bring the baby up, the baby's terrified, and just put it in the water, and then they do it for the Son, and then they do it for the Holy Spirit. So the question then is, why was Jesus baptized? And why in the Gospel of Matthew, when Jesus is great commission, does he command his disciples to go forth, making disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit? Why is that so significant? And why, if we're somebody who's a Christian, should we be baptized? What does baptism mean anyway? Is it something we made up just because it would be fun to put Kingsley in a big tub and jam him under the water and bring him up and he'd be sopping wet and we could all go, ha, 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 ha? Not really. That's not what it's about at all. Baptism is historical. And Christians have been getting baptized for 2,000 years. Melissa and I really like to watch some of these kind of like medieval-oriented shows. There was this show on TV called Vikings that was on the History Channel, if any of you have ever heard of it. And what was interesting in, in, in that show, when shows like that, when somebody converted to Christianity, when they made a profession of faith, as we call it in the Methodist Church, when they said they now believe in Jesus, he died for my sins, I'm coming to him as Lord, the way they would make that official would be through baptism. Historically, the thing that marks us as Christians is baptism. In the book of Acts, in chapter 15, there was a debate going on whether everybody should be allowed in the Christian church. The first handful of years, it was only Jews. Nobody else. And Jews, Jewish boys at eight days, year, eight days old, would get circumcised. And still do. I remember when I was in Jerusalem about nine years ago now, eight years ago now, and I was at that big wailing wall where you can put the notes in. Behind that, up on the balcony area, they said you could do your bar mitzvahs here, your bat mitzvahs here, and it said, and we do circumcisions. It's kind of weird for me to bring your baby in and have somebody do that. Um, that usually happens in a hospital, but that, that is the mark that you are part of the Jewish community. And getting baptized, historically means you are now part of the faith of the church. Now, there's different understandings of baptism. Some churches say, well, we baptize babies, and some say we don't. Well, in the United Methodist Church, we do baptize babies. But why is that? Do we believe that if we baptize a baby, that they know Christ, that that gives them salvation, that they're going to heaven? No, we don't believe that at all. We do believe that we're born into sin. We do have the stain of sin on us. So when we baptize a child, whether it be a font like this or something else, we are asking the Holy Spirit, God, to move in this child. We're asking the entire church to make a covenant to raise and love this child so that one day this child will stand up here and say, God was present in my baptism, and I believe in Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. 
Now, some folks would say, but we shouldn't baptize babies because they're not old enough to understand what's happening. They're not old enough to understand Jesus for themselves. In the United Methodist Church, if we have a teenager or an adult, would we baptize them, then ask them for a profession of faith? Of course not. We would ask them to profess their faith in Christ, and then they would be baptized. And wait for it. I love immersion baptism. If anybody wants to get baptized, profess their faith and get baptized, we can go down to the Susquehanna. I wouldn't recommend today unless you're at the Polar Bear Club. But I love immersion baptism because that is the way Jesus was baptized. He went under the water and he came back up. But one of the big differences between churches that don't do infant baptism and the ones that do is a basic understanding of what baptism is. Does baptism get you to heaven? It does not. Does baptism forgive your sin? It does not. I would say we're born with a stain of sin, and that can be washed away, but I don't believe that if a baby is born and it's not baptized, and God forbid it passes away, that the baby's condemned. But the big reason we baptize babies historically is because that makes them part of our tribe, part of our community. When you are baptized, or as Roman Catholics would say, christened, you become part of the Christian community. You are one of us now. And we have made vows here in church to say we are going to love this child and we are going to walk with this child so hopefully one day he or she professes Christ for themselves. It doesn't get you to heaven. It's not a silver bullet. It's not a magic shield around them. And I've had to tell some parents that very thing. But the thing that makes you historically part of the church is baptism. That's the thing that separates Christians from Jews and other faiths. Jews have circumcision. Christians have baptism. And in Acts 15, the big debate that was raging was, okay, we'll let the Gentiles and we'll let these Greeks in to be Christians, but the men have to be circumcised like the Jewish men. But then Paul said, but wait a second. We don't need to do that anymore. We have the waters of baptism. And the Lord Jesus told us to go forth, baptizing everybody in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Virtually every church I've ever been in, whether it's an infant baptism or a believer immersion baptism, they always baptize saying in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. And why do we do that? Why do I do it? Because the Lord Jesus Christ commanded us to baptize that way. In the book of Acts, however, though, it says people were baptized in the name of Jesus, but they hadn't yet received the Holy Spirit. And then hands were laid on them, and they did. So what we can see in Scripture is, depending on how you read it, our Salvation Army and Quaker brothers and sisters, they can say, well, we're going to take the verse that says, uh, John baptized with water, but Jesus will baptize with holy fire. We're going to use that for baptism. And if that's your interpretation of Scripture, that's fine. But the majority of Christians the world over believe in water baptism. Does the water itself have any power? No, the water is just a symbol. But the question is this, if a child waits to their 12 or 13 to profess their faith in Christ and then is baptized after that, are they really part of the church until that time? The concern we have historically is when we baptize a baby, are they saved yet? Do they have salvation yet? No, but they are one of us. They are one of us because they've been marked by the waters of baptism. They have been marked for Christ, and they are part of our tribe. I remember when I was in Potsdam College with Melissa, there was a couple of African exchange students, and I finally got the courage to ask them one day because each of them had a couple slices on their upper cheek. And I said to them, I said, can I ask you a question? They said, sure, Paul, what's the question? I said, did you get injured? And they said, no, why? I said, well, I see these scars. They said, you see, when we turned 13 or so, our tribe, this was the mark of our tribe. So anywhere we go in Africa, they said, that knows about our tribe will know we are part of that tribe because that's the mark of our tribe. Baptism is the mark of a Christian. Now, can somebody be on their deathbed and come to Christ and never get baptized? Absolutely. Will they be in heaven with the Lord Jesus? They will. Will they be part of the Christian church? They will not. <laughs> because to be part of the universal church, to be part of that great cloud of witnesses, all those people on earth, the thing that sets you apart as a Christian 
is that of baptism. And that's why baptism is significant. Now, regarding infant baptism or believer baptism, I had a seminary professor say this. You can drive your car in the garage or back it in. But as long as it gets in there, that's all that matters, right? The only thing that can save us is repenting and coming to the Lord Jesus. There's been a debate for centuries on how to properly baptize. But friends, baptism is not salvation. Baptism is bringing us into the Christian church. Or for our Baptist brothers and sisters, it's the affirmation of what Christ has done for us. We die with Christ and are raised in new life. And at that point, somebody becomes a member of the church. What we have in the United Methodist Church is we have baptized members and professing members. Is it possible that we baptize a baby and they never profess their faith in Christ ever? It is, and it happens. But we believe if, if parents are willing, we're not going to force people to baptize their babies or their children, but we want to mark them for Christ. We want to love them, we want to care for them, so that one day they can say that God was present at their baptism and they, that they do believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. So if you've been to different churches before, and wonder, how come this church only baptizes teenagers and adults by what I know people call the dunk tank? And how come here we do this? I had a Pentecostal, I had a Pentecostal pastor friend who's retired, and he used to come to our car washes at the Moravian Methodist Church, and he would say, Do you guys believe in John the Baptist or John the Sprinkler? So there's different ways to baptize. But really the changing power is the Lord Jesus Christ. When we come to Christ, that is what salvation is. That is what restoration is. Baptism is the affirmation, but it's also the way by which we are officially part of the tribe. If you get engaged to somebody and you have the ring on your finger, are you married yet? You're not married yet, but you have made a commitment the way we make a commitment to Christ. But the official seal, the wedding license, is not a baptism. So what I say to folks is, Number one, if you haven't ever come to the Lord Jesus Christ and repented, I'd encourage you to do so because he's changed my life and he's changed yours. But if you haven't been baptized, be baptized. Whether it's by sprinkling or immersion, that is your new life in Christ cemented. And it also makes you part of the universal Christian church. Not only do I have salvation in Christ through his forgiveness, but I'm part of the church. And I know I'm part of the church, not just because I have a membership certificate, but because I've been baptized. And that makes me officially one of the tribe. And that is why in baptism of the Lord, friends, baptism is so significant. Amen. Well, friends, with that said, we're, we're not going to do times at all for today, because we don't really have anybody, but if anybody here, well, I, I know we, we did. We, I guess Terry and Rose will leave it in your mailbox for you. Um, and uh, uh, let me, let me uh, I guess, offer a prayer for those that um, are giving online or will be giving this Sunday. Let me pray over that. Lord God, we thank you for all of those who are faithful to the ministry of your church. The church that helps shepherd people into the arms of your son, Jesus Christ, and then uh, offers them baptism so that they might be renewed, they might have new life in you, they might die with you and rise with you but they might also be part of your church and part of that great witness here on earth, set apart, marked as Christian. We ask you to bless our tithes, bless our offerings, grow them, multiply them, so that the ministries of this church can continue to be strong. And in your name we pray. Amen. And our closing hymn, again, that I won't sing because I value your life, uh, is in the faith we sing, 2117, Spirit of God, and it really is a beautiful hymn. And what, what it's talking about is, is the Spirit kind of coming over us and, and filling us. Um, I remember talking to my late Grandpa Winkleman once, uh, one of the smartest guys I've ever met, only went through eighth grade, was an old farmer. I tried to tell him about the Holy Spirit. He smiled and he goes, are you sure it wasn't yes, Paul? I said, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> so when you feel the love of God fill you and the warmth of God fill you, or you feel that peace that passes all understanding, that's the Holy Spirit. So, so with that said, friends, I know that this is not the service we wanted. It certainly isn't the service I wanted. And those people that are watching at home, um, again, what, what, a, what a joy and a privilege it has. It is to have you all here with us this morning. 
Um, and let me offer you this, this blessing and, and this benediction. Um, on this baptism of the Lord Sunday, the day that we celebrate Jesus being baptized, friends, if, if you have faith in Christ or are coming to faith in Christ, if you've never been baptized, I'd encourage you to do so, whether it's by sprinkling or immersion. This is your, your full commitment to Christ beyond what you've already done, and it also makes you part of the 2,000-year universal church. You officially become one of the tribe. So I hope and pray that you all stay safe and uh, don't go out sliding around. Uh, don't walk around with anything gritty on your feet because it's pretty icy out there. And friends, I pray that this day and always will be blessed in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, like Jesus taught us to say. Let us pray. Lord God, we thank you on this baptism of the Lord Sunday uh, for the gift of baptism. John the Baptist baptized your son Jesus, and later on Jesus commanded us to go forth, bringing people into, into faith with you through your son and baptizing. And may we continue to do this. We pray for our congregation that's not here today. We pray for all those people that are out and about. We pray that they're saved and warm. God, bring us back here next Sunday so we might worship in person. In the name of your most precious and glorious Son, we pray. Amen. And friends, have a great day and a great week. And I hope to see you soon, and not on a camera, but actually see you soon. Take care and God bless.